The peace of our Savior Jesus, the Anointed One of God, be with you. The word of God that we're going to meditate on this morning are the words of the second lesson from Acts chapter 4. I'd like to just reread one verse from that, verse 27. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. This is the word of our God. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you have filled the pages of your Old Testament with prophecies. As we hear your word today, we are becoming aware of how you have fulfilled those prophecies for us and by doing so revealed yourself as our Messiah. We pray that you would continue to grow our faith in you today through this message, that we may indeed be bold to witness about you to the world. In your name we pray. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, it all began with a man who was crippled from birth. He had some kind of deformity in his feet and ankles so that he couldn't walk. Forty years he had been that way, never walked once. Sat by the gate at the temple begging because that's all he could do. John and Peter went to the temple one day. As they did in the early Christian church, the Christians gathered at the temple regularly to hear God's word, to remind themselves of what Jesus had done and to worship him and encourage one another. And as they went, they saw this man, and they healed him. He had been a man that we would say was wheelchair-bound for 40 years. And yet, in just an instant, this man, who had never walked before, was jumping, praising God, walking all around. You can imagine that sent a stir through the people that were in the, the temple complex. As they saw this man, they knew him. They had seen him year after year after year. And yet here he is, jumping around, and they're asking, why? How? Peter and John took advantage of the situation. They were going to witness about Jesus. So they spoke up to the people. Oh, this this man didn't get his ability to walk from us. He wasn't healed by anything that we did, but he was healed by the name of Jesus. You remember Jesus, right? Jesus, who was crucified, the one that you and the rulers of the Jews put to death. You killed the author of life. You killed God's son. But he's alive. He lives. Now repent and believe in him. Well, not only did that get the attention of the people, it got the attention of the Jewish leaders especially when John and Peter would refer to Jesus as being alive, the resurrection, because most of those leaders of the Sanhedrin were Sadducees. The Sadducees did not accept or believe in a resurrection of the dead. When they heard what John and Peter were talking about, they they seized them and threw them in jail. And the next day, they brought them before them and they interrogated them. And after interrogating them, they commanded them not to talk about Jesus and especially not about this resurrection anymore. Peter and John's response, not, not going to happen. We're going to talk about Jesus. It's more important that we talk about him than listen to you because he's the savior of the world. Well, those Jewish leaders continued to threaten them, but then they had to let them go. What could they say? Here was a man, 40 years, couldn't walk. Now he's walking. And that's when our text picks up the story. Peter and John go back, we're told, to their own people. That's probably referring to the apostles, but also to other believers who were gathered as those Christians did when Jesus was ascending into heaven. After that, they had gathered in a room day after day until the Spirit was poured out unto them, probably still gathering in that room. And here they went back to be comforted and encouraged by their brothers and sisters in the faith. You see, they had made a pretty bold witness to the, to the Sanhedrin about Jesus. And they were bold. But don't think that they weren't also a little bit afraid. They were not 
ignorant of the fact that the group that they had just witnessed to was the very group that had put Jesus on the cross. They were aware of that. And so they turned to their brothers and sisters and they shared with them what they had said and the threats that had come to them from the Sanhedrin. But this group of believers, we're told in our text, literally was one in heart and mind. They were united by the Spirit in what they were doing together as witnesses for Jesus. And so in one heart and mind, they encouraged each other and they turned to God in prayer with one voice. It's interesting because the text doesn't say they lifted up their voices. It says they lifted up their voice, singular. United together, they prayed to God. And today we're going to look at their prayer because in that prayer again, our Lord Jesus, like last week in another prayer, is revealing himself to us. Revealing himself to us in a prophecy, revealing himself to us in a fulfillment, and then revealing to himself to us as the energy and the power which gave these people the boldness to witness. Notice as they begin their prayer that they call upon the Lord Almighty. Literally, the word there is master. They don't call him father this time. They call him master, Lord, powerful, because they're asking him to use his power on their behalf. They call him the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth and the seas and everything in it. He is indeed the powerful God that we can turn to in prayer when we need his help and his protection. And the first thing that they say about this powerful God is they recognize his power already years before. When he spoke, and notice they call him David, not the one who spoke these things, but the mouth of God, the God, the Holy Spirit. God spoke in the Old Testament. God spoke the words they're about to quote. And then they quote the words of Psalm 2 from the Old Testament. And what did that Psalm talk about? It talked about the nations raging against the Lord and against his anointed one. The word that's literally used there for rage is the word to snort. You know what it's like to snort, right? (laughs) Right? Like a horse. (laughs) You notice what we do with our face when we snort? (laughs) We have a look of disdain on our face, don't we, for what we're snorting at. And that's the idea behind the word snort. The nations snorted at the Lord. They looked at the anointed one of the Lord with disdain, arrogantly looking at him. And then it says, and the peoples plot in vain. The peoples were plotting. They were conspiring. They were making plans against the Lord and against his anointed. But those plans failed. They were useless. They were empty plans. And then it mentions the kings and the rulers who took their stand. They opposed. They also were against the Lord and against his anointed one. This is what God said through his servant David. And the amazing thing is he said this a thousand years before these people are quoting that passage right here and now. A thousand years before this. And what makes that so amazing is that now the apostles especially and all the people whom the Lord Jesus had promised he was going to pour out his spirit on them so that they could discern the truth of the scriptures, they now understand what these words mean. You see, they'd been saying these words for years, years and years and years, because the Psalms were their hymn book. They sang them, they knew them, they they probably had them memorized. And now, by the Spirit's power, They're looking at those words, they quote them, and then they say, indeed, indeed what? Indeed, what God said just happened. We witnessed it. The nations snorting against the anointed of the Lord. Well, the soldiers who looked at Jesus with such disdain, who treated him as if he was just a piece of meat, an animal that they could hit and throw around, and the peoples, The word that's used there is the word for the people of Israel. Even the Jews, God's own people, were plotting against Jesus, conspiring against him. Again and again, we we saw that happening. They were always trying to trap Jesus in some way. They were planning to kill him. They were trying to put him to death. And yet, all their plans, all their plots came to nothing. 
they failed. And the kings, the rulers, indeed, that was Herod. That was Pontius Pilate. These Gentile kings and rulers who joined with those Jewish people to put Jesus to death, who stand opposed to the Lord and his plans, who opposed his anointed one, the Messiah, Jesus. See, they understood now. All of these things were being said about Jesus. A thousand years before it happened, God had said this was going to happen, and now they witnessed the fulfillment of the prophecy right there before them. And yet, all those things that were prophesied that these people were going to do, they didn't fulfill. They didn't accomplish what they wanted to. Their conspiracy failed. Yet, all the things that they did in their wickedness with their wicked hearts happened, but not because they were trying to do something, but because God was doing something. And that's where they now go on to in their their prayer. Lord, what you planned and what you had already said was going to happen took place just as you planned it by your power. See, these people who were snorting at and opposing God and Jesus were pawns in the hand of the one who powerfully controls all things. And through their wickedness, God actually was accomplishing his will, accomplishing the hanging of Jesus on a tree as a curse for the sins of all people. Friends, there are 400 plus prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament. We heard another one in our gospel lesson today. Did you hear it? When Jesus got the scroll of Isaiah... And in that scroll, Isaiah had prophesied about a servant who was going to come and free the captives, bring the year of the Lord's favor to God's people. And Jesus read those words from that prophecy right there in front of the people in the synagogue. And then he set the scroll down and he said, right now, right here, this prophecy is fulfilled in your hearing. I'm the one that this was prophesying about. I'm here. See, every single prophecy about Jesus in the Old Testament has been or will be fulfilled. Some of them are yet coming in the future. They have been or will be fulfilled in Jesus, our Savior. And they're fulfilled so that you and I know three things in particular. One, that God is a God who keeps his word. Prophecies made years and years, thousands of years ago, every single one came true. Secondly, Jesus fulfilled those prophecies, which tells us that Jesus is that promised Messiah of the Old Testament. He is the Son of God. And three, the fulfilling of those prophecies was so that our salvation might be accomplished. Everything that God planned since before the beginning of time about how he was going to save us has taken place. We have been saved. Jesus has paid for our sins, risen again, just as it was prophesied about him. The Jews who lived at Jesus' day, for the most part, rejected what those prophecies said. They knew them. They had them. They read them again and again in the law, which they read as we even heard when Nehemiah's time, Ezra was reading the word of God to them. But they rejected. Jesus at least once said to those Jews, you search the scriptures. And that was the Old Testament. You search the scriptures because in them you think that you have eternal life. And these are the scriptures that testify about me. See, they read the prophecies, but they didn't understand. They didn't see that these prophecies were all fulfilled in Jesus, and they rejected Jesus. Is there a message, a warning there for us, dear friends? We have the prophecies and their fulfillments now written in the New Testament for us. 
We have Jesus revealing himself to us today and every day through these prophecies that speak about him and through their fulfillments in the scriptures. Are we searching those scriptures daily so that we know our Savior better and better? Do we look for Jesus in our prayers, in our feelings, in miracles in this world, rather than in the place he wants to be found by us, where he wants to reveal himself to us, in his prophecies and fulfillment in his word? Are we like some people in our world who dismiss these prophecies as just coincidences that just happen to happen? Or people who actually reject that they're even prophecies, that they were spoken and written down after the fact, so they weren't really prophesying anything. They were just people writing about things after they happened and saying that they were prophesying. Dear friends, when Jesus taught his disciples about himself, do you know where he went? He went to the Old Testament. He went to the prophecies about the Messiah. And from those prophecies, he taught them all about himself, about how he was coming into this world, how he would die, how he would rise again and be our Savior. All of that contained in the prophecies of the Old Testament. And today we too need to search those prophecies and see their fulfillments in Jesus that we might be encouraged just as these people were encouraged. You see, when they quoted that prophecy from Psalm 2 and looked and saw that it had been filled in their midst, it gave them courage. Because they knew from that prophecy that Jesus was going to be opposed. They recognized that God had already told that the the Jews were going to do the terrible thing that they saw happen to them, that Jesus would indeed be killed. But they also saw by seeing the prophecy and fulfillment that everything was under God's control. Everything was going according to God's plan. And so they knew as they stood there today being opposed and threatened by the Jews of their day now that God was still in control. And because of that, they were confident. Their world was still going to threaten them. The Jews were still going to oppose them. They were going to be in situations where their life would be in danger. Is it any different today? When you and I speak about Jesus in our world today, is that gladly received or do people snort at us? Do they ridicule? Do they persecute? And what will we do when that happens? Will we try to hide? Will we close our mouths? Will we, as our sinful flesh wants us to do, just lay low for a while so that people don't know we're Christians because otherwise it feels kind of bad when people laugh at you and say nasty things to you and it doesn't make you feel very good? That's what our sinful flesh wants to do. But look at what the believers did at this time. They got on their knees and they prayed. They prayed for boldness. They knew that they were going to suffer. They knew that they would still have things happen to them in their lives. They weren't ignorant of what was going to come because Jesus had told them that people would reject them just as they had rejected him. They didn't worry about the threats. They put that in God's hands. They said, Lord, you look at the threats. They didn't worry about whether they did miracles in the future or not. They put that in God's hands. Lord, you do miracles as you see fit. What they prayed for was boldness, courage. And God immediately answered their prayer. He shook the room to show them that he heard their prayer and that he knew what they were praying for. And he filled them with his spirit so that they could boldly confess their Savior Jesus. Not in comfort, because they knew they wouldn't be comfortable in the future. These same people were the ones who later on gave their lives for their Savior. They knew it wasn't going to be easy, but they were praying that God would make them bold so that they didn't shy away. They didn't 
lose faith. They didn't become afraid of proclaiming the name of Jesus. And what was the result? The result was people came into the church. The result was these people were bold to live their faith. The result was that the name of Jesus was glorified and testified in their world. Friends, let us today pray for boldness. Our lives too, like theirs, will be faced with difficulties and trials as we testify to the name of Jesus. But let's look again at that prophecy and its fulfillment because there our Savior is revealing something to us. He's revealing to us again that he is our Savior. And he promises through that to also hear and answer our prayers. Maybe not by shaking the room, but he promises that he will answer prayers prayed in Jesus' name. Under his authority, God will always answer our prayers. And he has already answered our prayer because he's already filled us with his Holy Spirit when he baptized us. And he continues to fill us more and more with that spirit as we hear his word and we receive the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. The Lord is giving us his spirit too in order to make us bold. Pray for boldness, friends. It's not our natural inclination, but we need to conquer that sinful nature in us. And that comes as we pray for boldness and God gives us his spirit. He reveals himself more and more to us in his word, in those prophecies and fulfillments, so that we are so confident in our faith that we are unafraid to speak of Jesus. And as we speak of Jesus, to everyone around us, as we speak of Jesus, Jesus gives us a promise. He says, whoever confesses me before men, I will confess before my Father in heaven.